We've asked Alan Jackson to be our special speaker this morning. So Alan, would you share with us what the Lord has laid on your heart today? I would. Thank you. Thank you for that honor. And thank you for the privilege of having a few moments here. You know, when you see me, uh, you should understand I am very much a turtle on a fence post. Uh, I grew up in a barn in Tennessee. You'll have to excuse my, but if you ever happen to be driving along the road and you see a turtle sitting on a fence post, you'll know one thing for certain, it didn't get there by itself. And I am very, very conscious today that my, the opportunity to share with you for a few minutes is because I'm standing on the shoulders of many who have preceded me, certainly my parents and their faith, um, the team that helps me. You know, I've, I've served a congregation for four decades. I preached lots and lots of sermons, and nobody cared unless they were sitting in the building with me. And when the team of people who work with me began to make partnerships like folks with the bots and so many others, other people started to listen. Uh, I know it has very little to do with me and a great deal to do with families that have been faithful like this one. So, And NRB, thank you for your faithfulness through the years. I'm somewhat of a, a latecomer to this story, but I love the legacy and the heritage of faith that you represent. And I want to thank you for that in the most sincere way. It matters a tremendous amount. And I don't think there's ever been a season when it, where it was more important than right now. Uh, I want to talk about that for a bit, but I'm a pastor. Uh, that has been the assignment God gave to me. And I, I always tell our team when we're doing staff training that if you only have one tool and it's a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And God asked me to be a pastor. And whenever I look at a group of people, I, my response is to shepherd. So I, it's a bit presumptive of me to shepherd a room full of leaders such as yourselves. And it's just a brief bit of time we have. But if you'll allow me, that's the role I'm going to take for just a few moments. Uh, I, I know you all have your own arenas and points of leadership and influence. But God has called us to this generation. And I love the memory. I love to look back and see the legacy and the heritage of the sacrifices that have been made that brought us to this point today. And I'm a student of history. I earned a degree in history. I'm grateful for that. But I believe the point of looking at history is to help us understand how to respond in the present and to have the most effective response to the opportunities of the future. And we stand at a pivot point. We're not conducting business as usual. We're not just convening worship services or preparing broadcast or building annual plans. Uh, we are standing at one of those unique pivot points in history. You know, as I studied history, I always thought, how fun, how much, what would it have been like to have been in that final group of people gathered with Gideon, waiting to blow the trumpets and break, break the clay pots? Or what would it have been like to have ridden with Paul Revere through the streets of Boston? I didn't get those opportunities. But God called us to the 21st century at a pivot point in human history. Five years from today, we'll look back at this moment and we'll understand we were standing on the precipice of change in a way that we have not seen in our lifetime. I believe that to be true. I want to share a verse of scripture. It's Psalm 11 and verse 3. It says, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? When the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, I believe this. If the psalmist asks the question, it's because there's an appropriate response. And I believe that's the question that's before us because we're watching the foundations be destroyed. Things that are commonplace now in the evening news that are a part of primetime programming, if you watch network television, would have been unthinkable not very long ago. Uh, we, we watch um, men competing against women in the swimming pool, and it's difficult to find someone with a voice to say, perhaps that's not right. The fact that the man put on a women's swimsuit doesn't really qualify him to be in the pool. When they redefine marriage, we have difficulty finding our voice. I checked my Bible. God has not changed the definition. When family's been redefined, we, we're watching all of these things happen, and the in the current day, we're watching authoritarianism spread in an unprecedented way. Uh, we're watching the demonstrations of that in Ukraine and with Russia and the tragedy in Ukraine. I hope you're praying routinely and regularly, encouraging, encouraging others to pray for those people. But something is happening in our world, and it's not just on the other side of the world. It's happening on our northern border in Canada with mandates put in place, martial law declared. Because a, a handful of, more than a handful, a group of truckers had the courage to stand up against the authoritarian expressions of government that were not backed by science. Folks, a cloth mask as protection from a virus is about as effective as a screen door on a submarine. 
It's better than nothing, but it's not going to solve your problem. And we are watching something happening, and it's not primarily a political problem. We don't need a new politician or a new political party. It's not an ideological problem. The underlying roots are spiritual. And the church is uniquely equipped to respond to that, and that would be you and me. So I, I keep encouraging people. I've been asking the congregation for, for months and months now to do four simple things, to watch and to listen to what's happening around the world. You don't need to watch hours and hours of news a day. It will depress you and discourage you. In about 10 minutes, you can get the story for the day. They're just going to repeat the same thing over and over and over again. And stay off the Internet, and there's, there's crazy people on both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> the ones you agree with will begin and end with, thus saith the Lord. The ones you don't agree with will be on MSNBC, but that's another discussion. But, but don't spend too much time on the, the, with the, you just need enough to know what's happening in the world. Then you need to watch and listen, think, use the mind and the experience and the, the, the knowledge of the word of God that you've hidden in your heart and then act. Don't just be an observer of what's happening. Be ready to act on the truth that you know. Now, if we do that, we have to guard our hearts or we'll become angry. You'll become angry at the deterioration of the family and at the casual way in which we sacrifice 3,000 children a day or re redefine marriage or we sweep our faith from the public square and we say it's constitutional. We understand that's not true. It's a manipulation. You'll be angry and you can't afford to be angry and embittered and filled with hate. Jesus told us we have to forgive in order to be forgiven. So don't be angry with the people with whom you disagree. They need a heart change just like you and I have had one. In fact, I would submit to you that the real problem we face is not the depravity of the wicked that we see in the world. The real root of the problem we face is the indifference of the faithful, the ambivalence of God's people. We like our familiar seat in the sanctuary and our preferred parking place closest to the door of our choice. And we want to worship in, with the music style we prefer and the presenter at the front of the room to wear the wardrobe that suits our personal sense of style for a worship service. And we don't want anything to intrude upon that. Well, God has intruded. He's begun to shake our world. And I believe God is the one that's shaking our world. It began with a, a virus that came from Wuhan, China. You know, for the first few weeks after that, when we were, we were doing live streaming, if I said Wuhan online, it took three full-time people to take down the hateful messages that would come back to us. Truth is not being celebrated these days. Have you noticed? There, there's a verse of scripture. If you don't know it, you should. It's Isaiah 59, and I'm sure you do. It's verse 14. It says, justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets, and honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. I think we could agree that truth is struggling in the public square these days. It's not celebrated. It's not honored. It's not embraced. It's not highly valued. So what will we do? Will we wring our hands? Will we, will we mourn the loss of truth? Will we be angry at the deception and the dishonesty? I hope that's not your response. Because we have a better response. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If truth isn't welcome in the public square, you can introduce the truth. You have a sphere of influence. There are people who care about your opinion. They're interested in what you want to talk about, what you believe to be happening. Introduce the truth. Don't have a conversation without Jesus being a part of it. Let the people who know you, before you close a business deal, understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It matters to me. When I was seven years old, we were churched. My father was in veterinary school. He was about to graduate. He was two weeks away from graduation. He was taking national boards. My mother gave birth to my youngest brother. She had to have a C-section. And while she was in the hospital at the University of Missouri in Columbia, the doctors came in her room and said, Mrs. Jackson, you have cancer. And I'm afraid there's just not much that can be done. You have about a six-month life expectancy. That's not good news when you have three little boys. The doctors wanted to do radical surgery the next day. She'd had a C-section that day. They wanted to do radical surgery on her the next day. My father's graduating from veterinary school. He's standing there listening to that, and he said, I've been trained better than that. I wouldn't do that to a cow. 
To which my mother responded, I'm no cow. <laughs> they got on a plane a week later to fly to Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And my mother said a little prayer. Now, we went to church every Sunday, but we weren't Christians. You know you can sit in the church and not be a Christian? You can sit at NRB convention and not be a Christ follower. Please don't do that. She said a little prayer that if there was a God, that he would let her know the truth before she died. Whether that was to be Jewish or Baptist or Catholic, whatever that truth might be. So she could tell that to her sons and leave that to us as a heritage. They checked into Mayo Clinic and she went through a three-day series of exams through all the departments. And a doctor came in her room late one evening. She was alone in the room and the doctor came in asking for my father. And she said, he's not here, but would you tell me what you wanted to tell him? And he said, I will. He said, I don't really have a good explanation, but all of the tumors that we could see in the film and all the blood work, all the, the, the cancer that you had when you arrived here, we can't find it. Go home and raise your babies. Uh, my mom's still alive today. We moved to Miami Beach a few weeks after that. My father went to work on the thoroughbred tracks in South Florida, Hialeah and Gulfstream and My parents became Christians, and a Sunday school teacher was born again, and they, we stopped at his house one Sunday after church. They left three boys in the car in Miami, Florida. That's before we had hotlines to report that kind of abuse. And they went in his house, they spent about 15 minutes, they knelt in his, at a coffee table in his living room and accepted Jesus. The temperature in our home went down so much. That a few weeks later, I walked into the kitchen and said, what's happened to you all? Our folks, was, our home was a pretty intense place, B.C. What's happened to you all? And when they said they had asked Jesus to come live in their heart, would I like to do that? And I knelt in the kitchen floor. They told you the truth. At 4811 Jackson Street in Hollywood, Florida, and became a Christian. I was baptized in the Atlantic Ocean in Fort Lauderdale in front of the Sheraton. So when I read that verse that says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It changed my life, it changed my mom's life, it changed my family's life. It, it, it has rippling effects out across the time that I can see. And if truth is stumbled in the streets, I promise you, Jesus is enough. More than we need a political change, we need a change in the hearts of God's people, and that's you and me. Now, what's empowering about that is we have something to say about this. We don't want to wring our hands and be angry at others. We want to begin to do some business with God in a way we haven't done it before. What I'm asking you to consider is more of a Nineveh response. Do you remember the story of Nineveh? It's the big fish story in the Bible. God had a prophet. He wanted him to go deliver a message to Nineveh. Jonah was clever enough to understand that Assyria was a rising world power, and he would have preferred them to be judged by God than continue to gain power. So he didn't want to go. And when God said go to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction, and he had a little altercation with God. Have you ever had one of those? I have. God is more persistent than you are. You might as well say yes to him. If you're arguing with him today, the shortest path is just to humble yourself and say, I'll cooperate. Jonah finally ends up in Nineveh. He is a disinterested, unconcerned, resentful evangelist. That's not a great formula. Walks through the city 40 days, you're going to be destroyed, and I'm going to go watch. <laughs> and the, the, the message is that from the most powerful in the city to the poorest, the people repented. They put their faces in the dust and said, we have been wrong. Perhaps God will look upon us with mercy. Now contrast that with Jerusalem, the city of the king. In the middle of the city is Solomon's temple. It's filled with the covenant people of God. They keep the right holidays. They eat the right food. They worship on the right day. They have the scriptures. They've had the prophets. They have the biblical narratives of the miracle. It's their family story. And they won't repent. And Jesus on the Mount of Olives is on the day of this triumphal entry is weeping over the city. He said, if you'd only recognize the time of God's coming to you. But you didn't recognize, so now they're going to dash the heads of the babies in this city against the stones. Jerusalem didn't repent. And they were destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Nineveh did. Now they ultimately faced the judgment, but they didn't in that season. And I believe that's the choice that's in front of our, our, not only our nation, but our world today, but specifically our nation, because this is where God has asked me to serve primarily. Well, we humble ourselves and repent. It's not somebody else's problem, folks. This is us. 
We can't just do business as we have done it. This is our time in the arena. This is what we were created for, for such a time as this. I believe all that's gone before us is preamble to where we are today. What will be said of us? Winston Churchill, you remember that on the eve of a world war? And he had the, the difficult responsibility of leading a nation. And for, for many, many months prior to his coming to authority, the message that had come from all of Europe was appeasement. The church has been practicing a policy of appeasement for much of my life. We're called in the book of Romans and through the book of Revelation to be overcomers. We're told we have to overcome evil, not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. That's not a passive response. In Revelation 21, it says that all the blessings and the rewards of the kingdom that's in front of us come to those who have overcome. Europe had been practicing a policy of appeasement. We've done that. They took prayer out of the schools, and we nodded, well, we'll pray someplace else. They took the commandments out of the schools, and we nodded, and we said, well, we can say the commandments someplace else. They redefined marriage and put a rainbow on the White House. I was in Israel when that happened. When I came home, it made me physically ill when I saw the pictures. And we shrugged our shoulders and said, well, we can still practice our faith the way we want to. They've taken our faith out of the public squares. Don't put a nativity set on the public square. Folks, the heritage of this nation is of a Christian worldview. It didn't demand that you be a Christ follower. We've always been a melting pot with people from many faiths and many backgrounds. But the values that have bound us together as a people have always come from a Judeo-Christian worldview. And if we sacrifice that, we will lose our freedoms and our liberties and our opportunities. Our children will not know the things that have defined our lives. Churchill recognized the moment and had the courage to provide leadership. He said something to the effect of if our empire were to exist for a thousand years, when they look back, may they say this was its finest hour. And that's really my presentation to you this morning, and I don't believe it's derived from a history or from a a leader of a nation. I really think it comes from the word of God. When the foundations are being destroyed, what are the righteous going to do? Will we stand up? You'll lose some friends. You'll forfeit some opportunities. There'll be a deal or two slip through your fingers, but there'll be a whole host of people that will line up with you, thrilled beyond imagination that you had the courage to speak the truth. Don't speak it in anger. Don't be resentful. Don't be embittered. Certainly don't let it be wrapped in hate. It needs to be delivered with compassion. My family was destined for an eternity in hell. And God in his mercy said, you ask to know the truth. And I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's our message. That's our message. I pray that we come to the point that we have the opportunity to choose between multiple politicians who are Christ-honoring biblically inspired but between here and there we have to be the church that's enough the gospel is enough amen Amen. i know it to be true my family we were pagans and god in his grace intervened i'm not talking about something we deserve we certainly deserve judgment but we serve a god who delights in showing mercy even to the wicked So let's begin to humble ourselves and use our voice. And I believe that we'll have the privilege of year over year gathering together and celebrating the faithfulness of God. Russia and Ukraine is disruption 2.0. 1.0 came with COVID. There's going to be a great deal of misinformation, misdirection. Look at this. Don't pay attention to this. What we've endured for the last two years was not primarily about a, a virus. And what we're watching take place in the streets of Ukraine, as tragic as it is, is not about the invasion of a nation. It's about continued disruption in our world. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Watch, listen, think, and then act based upon your values. May I pray with you? Can we invite God into the midst of this in a very intentional way? Father, I thank you for this group of people for the remarkable influence you have given them, for the leadership that you've entrusted to them, for the platforms they have been given, for the voice they have, for the heart they have for you. And Father, we recognize today that we need your help, that the forces arrayed against us are greater than our physical strength. They're greater than our wisdom. We know we won't outthink evil or outwork evil or outorganize evil. We need your help. And we ask you now to let your power be demonstrated in this generation, in this time, Lord, let it be true in the streets of Ukraine. Let it be true in the halls of Congress. 
Let it be true in the pulpits of our churches, in our cities, in our towns, in our communities. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. May the hearts of your people be stirred. May there be an outpouring of your spirit like none we've ever seen in our lifetime. May we begin to see in church after church, in group after group, a Nineveh response of humility and repentance, of remorse for our ungodliness. May we not point an accusing finger at someone else, but may we quietly and gently begin to say to you, forgive us. I thank you that you're a God who shows mercy. And I thank you that we will celebrate the deliverance of our God in the land of the living. We praise you today, and I thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank amen. You. Amen. Thank you, Alan Jackson. God bless you. Our listeners love hearing his teaching on the radio, Alan Jackson Ministries. And uh, I want to say, um, when you get back home, say hello to your mother and father for all of us. And uh, we thank them for their faithfulness to the Lord. The uh, Faith of Our Fathers Award winner this year, Alan Jackson. And uh, thank you so much, sir.